Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, April 20th, 2023. It is great to be back with Professor Rob Phillips. Rob, as always, great to be with you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Good All to right. See you. We're going to pick up right where we left off yesterday, 2017. A really important point I want to make sure I understand. When you were talking about the scientific problem that has always bugged you, mm -hmm. and then we started talking about how, you know, with, with, with Milo, you got into the, the human impacts. Is that scientific problem prelude to human impacts, or is that the origin story hmm. to human impacts? Yeah, actually, it's kind of neither, I would say. I have to, I have to say that the, the problem that has always bugged me is a strictly scientific thing having to do with why. The way I've been couching it lately, and I did it in class and by one this year, and I've done it in my talks, is what I call stuff of tea. And what I mean by that is any, any old thing almost that you want to think about evolves in time. In other words, it changes over time. Some of the classics, we maybe talked about it, I don't remember, but you know, like planetary motion yeah. is a very obvious one, and that's sort of the origins of mechanics. Of late, there's all sorts of fascinating stuff of teas having to do with human impacts, such as the change in CO2 in the atmosphere, the change in the hydrogen ion concentration of the ocean, the change in the ocean sea level, the number of cows on Earth, which has been increasing, the decline in various species. You know, those are all stuff of tea questions. But also the, the evolution of the position of the island called New Zealand over the last 80 million years is a stuff of tea question. So the way I put it is that the, the question that kind of has always bugged me is why do things change and what are the mathematical rules and regularities of things changing? Originally, it was really tied to the notion of entropy and thermodynamics. It's a little bit of a misnomer, in my opinion. I learned this from Callan, that we really should call it thermostatics. And what I mean by that is, that although the intent, let's say in the mid-1800s, was to write down a theory of the time evolution of complex systems like the gas molecules in this room, in the end, what we really succeeded at, I would say, is equilibrium, which is the terminal privileged state of a system. That was especially in the hands of Josiah Willard Gibbs, probably the greatest American-born scientist, is my guess. And you know, he told us how to calculate that terminal privileged state. He gave us some hints about how to get to that terminal privileged state. In other words, I prepare a system like the gas in this room. We could move a bunch of molecules to your side of the room and put a partition and then remove the partition. And what would happen is there would be a wind as the molecules filled in the part of the room where I'm sitting here in a vacuum. And we really don't have general theoretical ideas about that other than words like entropy increases. And so the, the abiding problem of my whole career, you know, at home, we, Amy and I have always referred to it as the heat problem, but the abiding problem is what's the basis of spontaneous change? And in a way, life is a very weird, I won't say exception, but it's just a, it, it seems counterintuitive because if you play a movie of, did we talk about Humpty Dumpty? No. Okay, you know, it's a sad, it's a sad biography. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty took a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. If we play a movie of his life backwards, you'd just say, you'd cry foul, right? You'd be like, that's not the way the world works. But at the molecular level, there are many things where if you play the movie backwards, it's actually the way the world works. For example, the concentration of ions in cells is often has pumps that push it so that you're, the ions are going up a gradient rather than the natural, with quotes, direction, which is down the gradient. Natural like because of gravity? No, natural because of entropy. In other words, like if I put more molecules on your side of the room than mine, uh -huh. they will naturally, just by statistics of coin flips actually, they'll smooth out. Yeah. And so the movie that we're used to is smoothing out. Uh -huh. Maxwell's demon is this idea that actually you could, instead of smoothing out, you could accumulate gradients. And the thing I'm saying about life is that life has machines whose job is to accumulate gradients, but energy has to be paid. Mm. So the, the thing I would say is that, like the, the, uh, the, really the abiding problem of my life is how do we go beyond words like entropy increases? How do we go beyond the classic laws of heat conduction like Fourier, mass transport like Fourier, Fick's law, uh, to, to the full nonlinearity, the full generality? Because again, what Gibbs had to tell us was super general. I can use it to, to understand degree of ionization of atoms in a star, 
I can use it to think about the formation of ice. I can use it to think about whether or not a material is magnetic, the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin when I take a deep breath, like I did just now. You know, like all those are examples of equilibrium statistical physics, terminal privileged states, and it's generic. And the question is, the thing that really has fascinated me is, are there generic things to be said about dynamics? I think that biology is a good place to look for those. The human impacts thing is another example of time evolution, but it's not really, it's not really tied to that problem. It's just something that happened that I think is very tied to my going off on a boat as a kid and then going on a van and just having always had a very deep relationship with nature and designing my life accordingly. You know, I go to Alaska, that picture right there, every year, you know, on a boat, go surfing for two weeks. I try to go to the Galapagos, you know, every other year or every year on a boat. I want to be out in the ocean, the Maldives in Indonesia, you know, like I want to be out in nature and I feel in many ways that, you know, that's the story of my life in science. You know, we talked a while back about originally I thought I was going to do particle physics or right. whatever, but in the end, I have no hesitation in saying that I'm much more fascinated by the world right there, the world out the window. Mm -hmm. And so the human impacts part comes from things like that picture you're looking at is deep in the Aleutian Islands, mm -hmm. and there's no one there. There's some feral cows. And when we go to the beach to do our business, you know, you lower your wetsuit, um, what you see is plastic everywhere on the beach. It's like, you know, it's a trash can. There's no one around. There's no one and nothing around. And yet, there's tons and tons and tons of evidence of human activity, I guess. So I think I mentioned to you, I went to Israel in October. I sat with Ron Milo. We each gave each other, over the course of a week, we each told the other what we thought they were doing wrong with their lives. And I had some thoughts for Ron. And his thought for me was, as I told you yesterday, was, look, all that other stuff you do is cool, but the human impacts thing maybe is the thing that matters the most, where we uniquely are poised to possibly make a difference. I'm not sure that's true, but... Well, I'll get to you, but to yeah. tell, tell me about Ron Milo. What's his background? What's his story? Yeah, so he's an amazing guy. He, uh, he probably is the best person on thinking about data that I've ever met. Um, he, you, you can watch some of his courses online, which I'd recommend you do. Like They're called Biology and Sustainability by the Numbers. Um, he's a professor at the Weizmann Institute. He uh, is uh, very sharp. You probably know every Israeli has to go into the army. Yeah. And every year they choose, at age 18, about 30 people that they devote to this special unit. Um, I forgot that Talpiot or something like this. And, um, and many famous people like Uri Alon was also in this unit, people that we know in science. It's like an eight-year commitment. And uh, Ron was in that. You go to college, you learn CS, physics, and math. Um, he, interestingly, because I wrote this piece on the Feynman Lectures on the 75th, 50th anniversary, and I interviewed a lot of people about the Feynman Lectures. My last paragraph is about some of the characters I've known. A guy in the Yugoslavian army who used to read it when he was in the army. An Indian guy that was an IIT student in engineering that would, in his privacy, read Feynman. And Ron was known as a nerd amongst this group. <laughs> And he would sit around and read the Feynman lectures. So at any rate, he did his grad work with Uri Alon at Weizmann. He went to Harvard to work with Mark Kirshner as a postdoc, and then went back to uh, the Weizmann as a professor and was doing, let's call it, systems biology, but got interested in this by-the-numbers thing, started the BioNumbers website. He and I got together early on, actually, as a result of Elliot Meyerowitz, who's on the visiting committee of the Weizmann. And Ron and I started working really hard on this by the numbers worldview. And what we have a totally different view of things. So he always wants data first. I think I may have told you, I never want to see data. I always want to calculate data before I see it. Mm -hmm. And so our book that we wrote and many of the things that we've done together are all about the juxtaposition of the best data that you can, that's vetted, that you can look at and know. And then my angle is, can you do an, an order of magnitude estimate to justify that data? For example, um, you know, how much land do we use as human beings? Did we already do this? No. Let's just do it fast. You eat a few times 10 to the 2 kilograms per year. Few means three. So I think I may have told you, I learned this from uh, Sanjay Mahajan, but who was at Caltech and somebody you should maybe talk to. Few times few is 10. So, you know, this, this is my by one thing. I just tell them I only do one few 10 arithmetic. 
So a few times as few as 10. So you and I eat few times 10 to the two, a few hundred kilograms per year. The next thing we need to know is how many square meters of land do you need to get one kilogram of edible biomass? And the answer is a few. That's for plant. So few, kilo, few meters squared per kilogram times few hundred kilograms per year means minimum of a thousand square meters for each of us for our food. It's actually more because when you add cows to that, you can take it to 5,000 square meters. You and I together, if we both eat meat, take up one European football stadium. That's our footprint. Now just multiply by the number of humans and you've got how much land we use. And what you'll find is it's like 30% of the land. You can do estimates like that on any and everything. You know, like one of the amusing ones that I, I liked a lot that, that's in our book is when we do shakers of bacteria in the lab, we have a headspace, meaning there's, there's a region where you have air. And you can work out why you're shaking and how much headspace you need to have enough oxygen in order for the, the cells to grow. So anyway, along the way, as we were doing bio numbers, what happened is, you know, it just naturally led us to questions such as, what is the biomass of the Earth? And what is the dominant player in the biomass of the Earth? What's the most abundant protein on the Earth? And that just slowly but surely naturally led to questions at kind of larger scales. Um, I think I, I did want to say a few more things about Ron. Um, so he has uh, real administrative skills in a way. And so like when I was visiting him, what I was telling him was uh, I thought he should say no to twice as many administrative engagements and yes to twice as many scientific engagements because he's so clever and thoughtful with data. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, he's just a, a really, really special guy. During COVID, he was the guy talking to Fauci. He was the guy talking to the relevant people in Israel. We wrote a couple papers. I don't know if you saw, like we wrote one on SARS-CoV-2 by the numbers. We did another one that meant a lot to me, um, and this was kind of my contribution to it, which is, you know, if you go to Albuquerque, you can go to the Nuclear Weapons Museum, mm -hmm. and you can see the size of the two bombs that were used. And the thing I want to say about that is somehow the notion of leverage. What I mean by that is consider the massive material that in less than five seconds killed on the order of 70,000 people. You yeah. know? Well, at the height of the pandemic, the mass of all of the SARS-CoV-2 variants on the planet was, you know, like of order kilogram. I just find that, you know, so, so shocking because in a way we're all, even now, still reeling from the pandemic, I think. And yet, it's the, the mass of that is just like a little ball, like the size of my little ball over here or something. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I wanted to say something else. Maybe it'll come back to me, and if it, if it does, I'll, I'll make a comment. But he and I have had this you know, really, really long-term relationship of trying to think about numeracy. And what does numeracy mean? And I feel like that's the most useful thing that I do with respect to teaching here. And I think, you know, people like, I don't know if you've talked to Sterl Finney and Peter Goldreich, but, you know, both of those guys have taught this order of magnitude physics course, which I think is maybe the most important course at Caltech. And that is the thing I try to teach the undergrads, you know, mm -hmm. like, or teach everybody. Yeah. And the point being that we have all these discussions in the world, in our lives. How many people were at the inauguration? And it's just inane in a way that people can't independently say, look, I don't need to listen to Donald Trump or to listen to the newspapers. I will just take a picture of the mall in Washington, DC. I'll, I'll use my own powers of estimation and observation and I will draw my own conclusions, you know? I think that's very much lacking. Yeah. So it was it was Ron that convinced you to jump on this human impacts project. It he, just happened naturally between the two of us. I yeah. would say over yeah. over ten years. You know, like in our book, Cell Biology by the Numbers, um, we have a figure. You know, there's there's some macro scale figures of things, and uh, I'll show you a couple of them that you know just kind of caught the eye uh, as we were doing this. So. Uh, for example, there, we have a figure about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, you can't, 
you can't plot something like that. Or people, we had a another one that had to do with the uh, number of cells per cubic centimeter as a function of depth in the ocean floor. And you know, to me, those are those are really interesting things. But you know, the moment you look at something like that, you kind of can't unsee it. So you know, there there is the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. and it just gets bigger every year. And so, you know, the question the red is the deadest. Yeah. Yeah. And and the question in a way so basically what it is is it's the amount of dissolved oxygen. You know, so basically it's oxygen starved. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those kinds of things uh just caught my fancy and caught his fancy and they there was just a natural evolution, I think, is the the thing to say. And so um so like just to, you know, here's another example of a a great question for you, which is when will the amount of human created mass exceed biomass. Okay. You mean our mass, what we're made of? Not uh, all biomass. You know, like we're nothing yeah. in the grand scheme of biomass. Plants are where it's at. So, you know, the, you can figure out how much total biomass there is on the planet. And the question is, how much anthropomass is there? How much human made concrete, steel, plastic, you know, all that stuff? Anyway, the answer to that question is it already happened. There's more human-made mass on this planet now than there is biomass. Whoa. And so, you know, those kinds of things are worthy of consideration. You know, the, the claim is made that the number of humans that can be sustained on Earth without synthetic nitrogen is 4 billion. So we've doubled the population relative to the kind of what, what can be done in the absence of synthetic nitrogen fixation in the form of Haber-Bosch. So, um, yeah, so the, the human impacts things, I think, matter a lot. You know, obviously we have the Resnick Center here. There's a lot of interest among the students, I would say. People want to make a difference. And my thought is that it's really important to know what's true mm -hmm. before one starts talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was the database the end point from the beginning of when you started this with Ron? Was uh, it always going to be the database? Um, there, well, so, so there's two databases, there's BioNumbers, which has been around now for more than a decade and gets 30 or 40,000 hits a month. As we started to proceed on the human impacts thing, I would say, no, originally the idea was not a database per se, but there, there were particular case studies, you know, like this anthropomass thing was a case study. Um, we've been writing vignettes, but I got intrigued by the idea during the pandemic. I taught a course basically just on the, as soon as the pandemic hit third term, I just decided, okay, I'll do an online version of uh, human impacts by the numbers as a course, kind of like I had earlier done cell biology by the numbers as a course. And it just occurred as we were doing this, the students were having fun helping us write vignettes and think about numbers that it would be useful to have a one stop source of vetted numbers, uh, you know, like what I mean is if you take a look at the database, every entry is the same. It has the value of the quantity of interest in many different units. It tells you a summary of how it was measured. It reports the errors. It has a link to a GitHub where you can collect the original data itself in clean format, meaning just in a CSV file that's well organized so that you can just straight away put it into Python. Usually there's a graph which shows the time series and, um, and who, it, who made the entry. And so... So it's open source. It's, People can add to this. Uh, they can't add to it. They have to tell us. And that, there's a reason for that, which is the vetting part. Sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, we have re received some suggestions, not that many. Yeah. But allied with that is the notion of doing a book and doing estimates and vignettes. To me, the two go hand in hand. In other words, it's very important to have the data, but it's also very important to see if the data makes sense. Um, I'll give you another example, although it's a little bit trite. So obviously CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere. We're over 400 parts per million. Um, you can calculate how many molecules there are in the atmosphere. Just how by pressure times area is mass times G. So you can figure out the mass of the atmosphere. You know that the typical molecular weight is 30 because it's oxygen and nitrogen, and so you'll find 10 to the 44th molecules. If you work out you know, what 400 parts per million is, that'll take you up into like the 10 to the 38, 10 to the 39 CO2s. Then you can ask, given the 70,000 power plants 
on the planet, how much CO2 is being in, in, injected into the atmosphere every year, and you, you find a figure that's completely coherent with that. Ditto for cars. You know, in other words, they're not orders of magnitude off of each other. They're actually very coherent and not in some political way. In other words, like you don't need to spin anything. Yeah. You just say, how it's many cars numbers. are there are? How many cars are there? How many kilometers do they drive per year? How many CO2 molecules are emitted per liter? Which we know all that stuff. And you just do the multiplication. Same for power plants, you know. If, it's, if I got a bunch of 500 megawatt or one gigawatt power plants, I can estimate how much fuel they're burning, you know. I know how much heat you get out of burning fuels. And so we also know what the CO2 footprint of those things are. And so you can, you know, you can work it out and it's coherent. Again, I'm, I'm a novice in all this. There's tons of people on the campus that know a lot about these things. And the same goes, just, you, you, you just pick, take your pick, you know. You can ask about methane. I personally find things related to food super interesting. You know, how many, how many chickens do we slaughter a year? 80 billion. What's the standing population? Around 25 billion chickens. How does that square? Well, because we kill them every seven weeks, you know? And so that's, that's how you get to this, uh, this figure of, of, I think, 80 billion slaughtered per year, you know, 300 million cows. And then the biomass, how many whales were killed in the 20th century? It's like, you know, 3 million. How much biomass is that? It's 100 megatons, I think, something like that. So, you know, there, and then, then you can ask how many krill do they eat? And, you know, just, there's, there's, there's a bunch of dominoes that fall that I think are super interesting. And how did you timely. go about defining the project? How do you determine what counts as a human impact? Yeah. Um, one of the ways we did it, which was a lot of fun, is we started a spreadsheet with the students in the class. And we just tried to independently think about things that qualified as human impacts. And then we made a list and prioritized, you know, and also tried to see what are the things that seemed unequivocal as human impacts. And I think. You know, one of the hard topics there, one of the most insidious things is shifting baselines. So I was telling the students in the class the other day that when I go surfing in the Maldives, I wear my swim goggles around my neck. And the reason for that is, you know, you probably know a lot of time when you're surfing is spent waiting because set waves come in sets, like 15 minutes apart. So between sets, I put on my goggles, I have, I have my leash attached to my board, but then I go down and I swim around and I look at the reef and whatever. And what I can tell you is that, you know, over the last 40 years that reefs are just not the same. And I've been talking to this guy, John Turborg. Um, did you ever see the Serengeti Rules, the documentary? You yeah. have to watch it. You have to watch it like today. Okay. Sean Carroll did this uh, for HHMI. It's about an hour and a half long and it won all sorts of awards. And it features about six or seven amazing scientists, Mary Power, Robert Payne. He's kind of the, at the top of the pyramid. He's the guy who took the sea stars in, the, um, in a small patch of the state of Washington, he removed all the sea stars, Pisastro Cratius, and then over the following years, what he saw is that it went from having 15 species to almost none. And the reason is because the Pisaster, the sea star, is the keystone predator. It manages all the things below it. And this is related to something called the green world hypothesis, which was posed in the 60s. Why are trees green? Okay, the ant, well, you could say chlorophyll, but that wasn't what the guy meant. What he meant is, why don't insects eat them all away? And the answer is because there's predators above them. So anyway, John Turborg is one of the people that you'll see in that video. And he and I, have, uh, he's going to come teach my class. And it'd be great if you want to talk to him. He's, he, was, he wrote a book called Where Have All the Birds Gone? There's a paper in science. You can look at it. We've lost 3 billion birds. But here's the thing I'm going to say. I think you might be too young, but I'm not sure. When we were kids, and we go on a trip with the family, in a car, every time you go to the gas station, splat. Yeah, you gotta wash your windshield, right? Can you, I mean, if you drive to Las Vegas now, just think about it. You literally do not even have to clean your windshield. So, that's the that's the shifting baseline. Back to my surfing story, I take students to Indonesia to go, and they go snorkeling or something, and they see some colorful coral heads here and there, and they're they're excited, and I'm just thinking to myself. I, I literally am on the verge of crying. The situation is so bad relative to what it was. And I don't mean to sound like some sort of environmental freak or, you know, Jacques Cousteau or something, but I do think it's true that there are shifting baselines. 
and I don't know how to penetrate that. You know, like I think this is a topic for you in your former life at the American Institute of Physics, your current life, for me in my life. How do we engage with the public? How do we engage with, you know, the kind of spirit of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the desire to know things? Did you appreciate that this project would, by definition, take you out of a scientific, data-driven bubble, that it would get you into politics and activism and science communication and all yeah, that? Yeah, I, I did, and I've done everything in my power to avoid it, and yeah. I continue to. Like, I just gave a talk about it on Monday at USC, and always people want to ask me about, about policy, and I always say, you know, what I like about science is that it's a system of militant ignorance, uh -huh. and I don't, what I want to do and that's been come up actually in the context of the Resnick for me personally, is I don't have anything to say about all that stuff. I want to be the person that can be trusted as um, you'll get a balanced view of what appears to be the truth as best we know it. Um, so it's interesting, you know, going in, we knew that there was, this, uh, maybe it's annual report from BP and on energy. And I think all of us on our little team were skeptical. And in the end, we concluded it's actually really one of the better places to look. And that made me feel good. And I, you know, I really, I'm, like, I'm willing to shop at Whole Foods and I'm all like, I like the notion of not pesticides or whatever, but interestingly, in some sense, this is, a, this is not an accurate statement, but it's like a, cliche, a metaphor, but I don't trust the mothers of the Central Valley on pesticides. You see what I mean? In other words, just even the act of trying to get to the data is a little bit scary mm -hmm. because people are so concerned with their agendas. So, yeah, I, I've tried to make sure that we are solid on the data without expressing opinions. So the Resnick Institute supported this project. Yes, yes. Tell me about your feelings of the the word or the concept of sustainability, right? Scientifically, yeah. it's very amorphous. Yeah. How do you use that in a rigorous way? Yeah. I have to, you know, th this is probably weak of me, but I have to, once again, refer to my belief in militant ignorance. You know, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to think about it. You know, like, when I go to the Galapagos, I see, you know, both at the level of, m of very small animals like ants and at very large animals like goats. At t and then also, you know, when you drive across Santa Cruz Island, you know, when you're in the middle of the island, which is, it's very fertile there, there's so many invasive plants, you know, and I, I even see it in my mountains here, you know, when I go on my bike rides, there, there are all these invasive plants. And so I don't know how to think about it, you know, like, they, uh, I think on four of the islands in the Galapagos, they used helicopters, sort of Sarah Palin style, w with guns. They had a few uh, emissary female sheep with pheromones that were tagged. And they killed 25,000 goats, I think, or sheep, or goats, I think, on, I, I misspoke before, I think it's goats, on four of the islands. And actually now there's like this eco-terrorism thing going on where people um, that are unhappy with policies in the Galapagos have said we're going to release goats. You know, it's just like, that's the kind of stuff that makes my head explode and just don't know what to do. But, um, but yeah, I mean, our impacts are so broad and wide. I, do, I just have to say I don't know. I had one of the people the other day in my talk, so I gave like my human impacts by the numbers exam as a talk. It's just a series of questions. And at the end, the, this person said, you know, you just make me think even more strongly that I want to go seed the clouds and you know put small particles in the upper atmosphere and I said you know this is a great example of where thinking rational people can so strongly disagree because I said I'm terrified of your prospect I wouldn't do that for anything you could offer me a billion dollars and I wouldn't do it no way you know maybe that's just my shortcoming as uh, but I just I don't know I don't, I just don't know. And I, I mean, I was so damaged by the pandemic because at the beginning I ran this coronavirus discussion group and we had so many sophisticated scientists and it was three times a week and it was super interesting and super cool. And after about four months of seeing the way people were, were reacting, and 
you know, everything from Bill Gates wanting to put chips in my arm through a vaccine to, you know, it's just another influenza to, you know, like just all of it. I just felt like I'm not cut out for this world. Like I don't know how to interact with that part of society. Mm -hmm. What about you? I mean, I know it's not your interview, but I mean, like, what's your take? It scared the hell out of me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're not ready for the next one either. We're not. Yeah, and I, and I fear, you know, it's a bit of a boy who cried wolf thing. Because, you know, you can expect the possibility of something with a tenfold higher mortality. Of course. You know, like a bird flu or something. And then everybody's going to be back into their mode of, I don't wear, you know, like masks don't work. Or, you know, like even, I, I even in the last month have had that kind of a discussion. And I, I, I like to personalize things. Like every time the U.S. has used its military, my thought is always, am I willing to send Casey, my son? If the answer is no, then I'm not in favor. Like, I got to I gotta be willing to put some skin in the game. Okay, so, you know, when I hear these polemics, and I'm not, like, I'm not one of, I don't want to force you to wear a mask or anybody, but upshot is, is that person really telling me that they would be game to have a surgeon working on their kid without washing their hands and without wearing a mask? Like, really? Mm-hmm. That's the world we live in. Some people are so polarized by their politics that they just sacrifice their kid in saying, no, I don't believe in microbes. I don't believe there's any such thing as transmission by, by air or whatever. I mean, I'm just like, wow, what a weird world of privilege. You know, people are driving around their Teslas with their GPSs, spouting off that kind of stuff. And I don't know. I had a I had a really really intense exchange on a flight once a Southwest flight. We were flying from like Denver here to Burbank. I, we had a left hand side window seat. It was during the big fire, the one on this these hills, which you weren't here yet for. So I could see the fires out the out the plane, and you know at some point it came to light that they had gone to Oral Roberts University, and they felt that I was destroying the world, people with the scientific worldview, and I told them I thought. They, I really thought that people like them should not be allowed to fly in an airplane because I was like, science is not a smorgasbord. You don't get to pick and choose which pieces you like. You know, like the nuclear reactor that, that heats your home is also the same nuclear physics that dates rocks and tells you about whether or not there were humans at the same time as dinosaurs. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> like, anyway, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of That's why you like to stay in your bubble. That's, That's why I like day. to stay in my bubble. Yeah, I just don't think my disposition is right for it and... Um, if you assess the human impact you know, from a broad level, what, what numbers have been most sobering for you? Hmm. I guess I would say that I think going in that I didn't appreciate the simplicity of the question of us eating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. In a way, that it, it, it feels like a few questions allows you to unravel the whole thing. Mm-hmm. What do we eat? Where does our water come from? And how do we power our world? Like if you follow those three threads, you've got it. You know, obviously there's other things that are interesting. Like, you know, I have radioactive isotopes in me because of atmospheric nuclear testing. Um, that's an interesting, you know, kind of nu- uh, human impact type thing, but. I just feel like those three questions frame the whole story. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose, I mean, I don't want to pick on anybody. Again, this this goes back a little bit to the focus on facts without beliefs. But I do want to say that I've become very sensitized in a way to our relationship with our, let's just say our relationship with our domesticated animals. And like this village right there, you can see the white patch up there, the, this, this thing, this is in the mountains uh-huh. near, near Grenoble. That in the summer is all pasture land. And I was just there last summer and, and I was trying to notice, I, it, it started to strike me. Like then I went back in the right, you can see Mont Blanc and I was up there and I went and climbed a mountain. And I, and I really was struck by what fraction of the Alps high altitude Alps is dedicated to pasture and that valley the valley of the Vercor you know I tried to get a a sort of an accounting of how many cows that whole that whole valley feeds 
And yeah, I just was very much struck with this question of how are we going to eat? How is this going to work? So for all of the ecological consciousness you yeah. know, that permeates society now, real or not, yeah. anything, any rays of optimism? Are, are there any numbers that are trending in the right direction? Mm. I think I need to think about that a little bit. I, I don't want to be a doomsayer because, again, I, I, I kind of want to express no, it's just, my, it's just the numbers. my militant ignorance. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm smart enough or thought hard enough to quite understand the implications of the numbers, but, you know, I guess um, one point I, I suppose I would make, but again, I think I'm speaking from a, a place of ignorance is, you know, a lot of this stuff is tied to power, you know, how we power our world. And if you look at our one page summary, I don't know if you've looked at this before, yeah, but, yeah. but you know, it tells you the sources of all of our power, mm -hmm. you know, and we measured in units of light bulbs. You know, and so you and I each are worth like 40 light bulbs, uh, the 100 watt light bulbs. And the vast majority of that comes from conventional burning of things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from wind, it doesn't come from nuclear, it doesn't come from hydroelectric. It primarily comes from burning things. And so, you know, I suppose the thing I, my piece of optimism is that smart people are thinking about the, the fact that there's a thousand watts per square meter of sunlight incident. People are thinking hard. You know, I know there's a lot of small scale operations now that are thinking about ways of using fusion. But, you know, that's been on the horizon. You, um, you know, from, years. Your, yep, from American <laughs> Institute of Physics days, you know, it's just around the, it's just a decade away. Yeah. It just keeps being a decade away. So, you know, that's, I, I don't know. I don't, th this I think is taking me too much into the realm of my ignorance to, Pro, to pro make any prognostication, one sign or the other. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But I do, I do just, I don't know, what would I say? One thing that Ron and I do every time, he does every hike he goes on, is he brings a trash bag. Like when I was with him in October, we every hike we went on, we collected trash. Well, one of the things he was commenting on is like, if you watched Mad Men, um, was that the name of the show? Yeah. Um, you know, I remember this kind of era where you go out on a picnic and then at the end, you pull the picnic uh, thing you had on the ground and you leave the trash behind. And, you know, if you think about smoking or you think about our handling of trash in the U.S., those, de those definitely have gotten better. And, you know, I, I, I think the, one of the most interesting museums in Paris, oddly, is a, like a couple blocks away from the Eiffel Tower. It's the um, Sewer Museum. I don't know if you've ever been to it. No. It has a history of the sewers of Paris, which is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, in a certain sense, what happened is long ago, like, you know, almost 800 years ago, the Seine was getting ruined. And so that was kind of the origins of, like, they realized they had to do something because they were fouling themselves. And, you know, the, the those kinds of stories, I think, are, are very interesting, you know, that we we do have figured out how to do smart things in our cities, you know? And so my hope, it, maybe this goes back to my job as a teacher, my hope is that young people, instead of getting, I don't know, this is my particular prejudice, getting overly political, yeah, instead get overly innovative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's a, this is not a policy question, it's really yeah. more deeply spiritual or philosophical question. Yeah. In looking at all these numbers and seeing where they're headed, yeah. right? Do you ever think maybe the planet would just be better off without us? Do you ever go there? Or do you not want to go there because you want to believe in innovation? You want to yeah. believe in solutions? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't even know what it would really mean to say that. You know, like better in what sense? Um, I mean, I guess I just feel like the natural world is the natural world and we're part of it. And... You know, like there, there are interesting speculations. In fact, I got an email after my talk the other day um, about civilizations destroying themselves. And like, is it an inevitability and you know, all these kinds of things. And you know, I don't know anything about all of that. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say, you know. Yeah. I just don't know what to say because humans, we're, we're kind of complicated. You know, like we're, there's, there's really great things about humans and there's really 
awful things about humans and you know we tend not to be very good at anticipating things and planning for them and then being ready um, but we're very good at responding to challenges or something so I don't know I just don't know how to think about how all that will play out I yeah. just don't know I mean you probably know the book the the world without us which is a fascinating book yeah you know, and it's got a comment I don't know about the numbers but you know like for example that New York City uh, would flood within days the subways and stuff in the absence of like you turn off all of our electricity just stop burning fuels turn off all the electricity on the planet done so many things will happen yeah and but I, I wouldn't want to say that the you know the world would be better off I mean maybe uh, whales will be better off you know like I could imagine lots of things like that I suppose like uh, but I don't I don't even know what I mean you know like what would happen to the Serengeti I don't know you know like it's it's an amazing experiment to think about but it's not one I want to do here's a much simpler question moving the narrative closer to the present yeah when the pandemic hit yeah. were you able to keep portions of your lab open was there automation that you can rely on or did you really shut down for a period well we shut down for a little while because it was really mandated in some sense by Caltech but the moment that we were allowed to have people in the lab at lower density we did and people you know we had a schedule because we have some people that are morning people some people that are night people and so we divided things so that people could still try and get work done but I would say you know unequivocally that it was a slowdown you know unequivocally and we'll never get that time back so yeah, we tried to be very proactive. You know, we tried to meet a lot in, in unusual ways. I tried to keep my mind on this idea of yeah. what can we do that's different. Um, Avi, who you know, was really insistent about us meeting at the park for lunch, which we did. So, you know, I decided to use my discretionary funds to feed us as often as possible outdoors, you know, and maybe at some point in the middle of the pandemic that might even have been a little bit off the policies of Caltech. I don't quite know. You know, but we definitely got together and tried to get together pretty often as a group and, you know, do team building or whatever you might call it. As a mentor to graduate students, yeah. some are international, they're stuck here, they're home yeah. by themselves. Yeah. What was that like, just sort of keeping everybody was, sane? Yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. And there, you know, I, I'm not going to mention any names, but there, there were certain people that I feel like they just almost didn't leave their apartment for a year. Yeah. You know, and... I don't know. I just don't know how to characterize the intensity of the consequences of that for any of us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I'm still definitely reeling from the whole thing. Scientifically, did you have something to offer in terms of understanding COVID? Um, I don't know. You know, I, I like the papers that we wrote. I think that they're pretty interesting. You know, like if you look at the number of citations of the SARS-CoV-2 by the numbers paper, it's, you know, it skyrocketed up into into the very highest citations that I've had in my life and the one the PNAS paper that was about the mass and the mutation rate and all that stuff that also I think um, mattered but you know did it did it make any difference to the grand enterprise I doubt it um, you know I get I don't know if you know this maybe I don't know were you here I, when did you come I, I gave like seven public lectures yeah, like to the employees yeah so like I, I talked to all of the the staff you know, I think there were 800 people on Zoom. So I put together a bunch of slides and I gave a, I gave a course for the undergrads on viruses, a week long course. So I, you know, because I had worked on viruses, so I figured I, you know, that's the kind of thing I tried to do to be helpful. And then I gave that talk at lots of places. I gave it at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and yeah. gave it in Dresden. And, you know, like I, I gave a lot of times sort of SARS CoV 2 by the numbers. Just, uh, I don't know, as a curiosity, I suppose. Or at least just to say, look, uh, in 1665, they sent Isaac Newton back to Woolsthorpe, but didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah. We, you know, we knew a lot about what was going on, and I figured I could at least share with people, like, here's the Baltimore classification. It's probably the best classification we have of viruses. Like, what does it mean? Why is there a classification? What does it mean to be an RNA virus versus a DNA virus? What does it mean to be double-stranded versus single-stranded? Why does it piss me off so much that you say influenza and SARS-CoV-2 are the same? It's like, influenza is so amazing. It's got eight separate RNA molecules. Give me a break. You know, it's like <laughs> super weird as an object. You know, we can't insult it like that. And <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 is interesting for its own reasons. It's 30,000 nucleotide genome that's got proofreading. You know, it's like, these things are amazing. 
So, uh, yeah, so it's sort of just trying to be helpful. But, I, you know, maybe this is being a bit pessimistic uh, and a little sad in a way for because I brought it up, I think, yesterday as well, and I think it's probably a, pres a feeling I have, which is, you know, I don't feel in some, you know, somebody like David Baltimore, I guess, at the end of the day, can make the claim that he's made a difference. And I'm not sure that I have, you know, it's like, like it's kind of a sad reflection on a life. But that's always for other people to judge. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's that's a good point of view. Yeah. So bringing it right up to today, what yeah. are you up to these days? What's on your plate? Yeah, I would say that it's, uh, it's three primary scientific things as far as research goes, and then uh, book writing and teaching. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's at work. Um, you know, and out of work, there are many questions as well that have to do with, what does it mean to get older and what are the big questions in a life and how does one stay in shape and whatever. But um, at the level of science, I've kind of already indicated to you, one of them is for sure the human impacts thread. And this is going to stay with you for a while. I think it's, well, this is what, what I was telling you about what Ron thought I should do is he thought I should devote all my effort yeah. to that. Uh, I think it is going to stay with me. I would like to, with, for example, my former student Griffin, write a book on human impacts by the numbers that's kind of like this one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know a series of short vignettes each vignette has a topic uh, whether it's water evaporation in hydroelectric you know like that's an interesting thing when we make dams we lose a lot of water by evaporation because there's more surface area like i didn't know that mm -hmm. going in um anyway so yeah the human impacts thing is mm -hmm. is a thread that's going to keep going uh i hope that i'll be able to find a way to support a student you know on that um then the big question that I mentioned yesterday, which is the nature of the meaning of genomes. So I told you we have 10 to the 17th or so nucleotides on the NIH databases, but we're really quite ignorant of the rules and regulation of, of regulation. How do genes get turned on? How do genes get turned off? That kind of thing. And then the last area is related to this sort of perennial problem that I've had on my mind always, which is the dynamics of systems that are out of equilibrium are their general principles and we have an experimental system that allows us to explore that in the form of biological filaments known as microtubules molecular motors that are known as kinesins which are present in our cells and atp and really trying to do a careful experiment theory dialogue so that's you know that's uh, i would say what's going on in the group um, we'll see how many more cycles of NIH funding that I can get, you know, like I, and that's of course a question always about, you know, when do people make room for others that I find interesting to think about. I mean, selfishly, I don't have any immediate desire to, to go do something else. Um, as far as book writing goes, uh, I just finished this book called The Restless Cell, which is about active matter and getting close to finishing one on the genome question, which is called Physical Genomics from E. coli to Elephants. Um, I have a personal sort of autobiography without any personal stories, more about the science that I've loved. So there's a section on the mathematics that's meant the most to me in this life, the physics that's meant the most to me, the biology that's meant the most to me, and then sort of the nature that's meant the most to me, and it will finish with the books that have meant the most oh, to cool. me. Oh, cool. Because, you know, I, I think I may have told you that I've asked like 1,500 people to tell me the five or ten books that have meant the most to them, and mm -hmm. I have this master list, and that continues to be kind of an important thing for me is just the role of reading in a human life. Yeah. The role of the written word, what Clifton Fadiman referred to as the great conversation. Um, and then, you know, teaching. So I guess I'll be teaching freshman biology for the next few years anyway. Continue to do the evolution course, continue to do physical biology of the cell, probably will do a human impacts course uh, I'd love a chance to do something about statistical physics again but you know those are the kinds of things that I guess are on my mind well you've alluded to it but now I want to move to sort of a thematic portion of our conversation yeah. I want to touch on teaching reading and writing okay. they're so important for you yeah. so teaching first when are you inspired to innovate a course and what kind of administrative leeway is there really yeah. to just do what you want yeah I would say you know for, even at Brown, I had that leeway. So, you know, I started as a professor in 1993. So I guess mm -hmm. I'm at the 30 year mark now and I've had the privilege, you know, at every stage and, and it's always been my tendency to try and figure out how to state a subject for myself. Like that's for sure 
the only way that I know how to engage with a topic. And you know, all these notebooks that you see up there, that's uh, all of them are courses that I've taught um, at Brown and here. I feel like, you know, the support I've gotten at Caltech has been intense and incredible. You know, we already talked about it a little bit. So, you know, I started teaching freshman biology with Pamela Bjorkman. We did a course that was kind of based on HIV, by one, which is this required core course. And I went to Ed Stolper and had suggested that it would be cool to do a strictly experimental course with weekly labs. And so they built a lab for me in uh, the Braun building. And basically we would take 24 students a year and I really tried to put together a cult of TAs. And I think a lot of our best courses are kind of cultish. Like Phys 11 is an example of that. That Tom Brello was the cult leader. Um, Axel Scherer had a, micro, a fabrication course that was for sure cult based. I remember very well when I first got here, the, the sort of the every year the continuity of TAs because a lot of these things depend on TAs, which I always think of as being performance art. Like I always tell them, I may be the conductor, but you're the performers, mm -hmm. and you take ownership of it. So anyway, Buy One X was an, a smashing success, I would say. Shortly after that, there was the evolution course, you know, with the notion of going on a field trip. That was very much inspired by, um, by Bob Sharp. I think I, t did I tell you the story of how I came to know of him? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I was just so moved when I read his oral history and I, and I learned from, because I've led, I think, four alumni trips. And so the number of alums, like he is the most cited professor at Caltech that I've encountered with all of my interactions with alums, Robert Sharp. Why? Because he took them to see the world. And so I was really deeply inspired by that. And, you know, at this point, I've led on the order of 15 or 20 trips. You know, Galapagos 11 or 12 times, New Zealand twice, Indonesia twice, Alaska twice, you know, like um, Dinosaur National Monument. And, um, and I feel that that is like, in a way, besides the order of magnitude thinking, the best thing that I can do is you know, give kids those little no write in the rain notebooks, ask them to start sentences with the two words I wonder. And you'd be surprised how hard it is for people. And so, you know, every day we have uh, two 15 to 20 minute moments of silence. I think maybe I mentioned that to you. And, and uh, I think that's very big. You know, physical biology of the cell is another one that was something I just, you know, did. There, order of magnitude biology is a new course that Justin Boyce and I did together. And <clears throat> so, I just think it's pure privilege at Caltech. I can more or less just teach whatever I want, I think. And um, so as far as innovation goes, I just, again, I think that I have been accused of being an elitist because instead of teaching to the canon or teaching to the test or teaching to the MCAT or teaching to the curriculum, I just sort of have an attitude of, let's consider this topic and see how far we can get and how would i state it if i were on a desert island not what does the text the canonical textbook say but what would i think of if i wanted to tell you you know like let's say you and i decided to spend six months teaching each other things you know and we each were going to be our best selves i just think that that's the best plan it's very at odds though with uh you know that there's a, a set of things to be taught and, you know, I think I find myself in a way partly at loggerheads with the people that do education research. And the reason I say that is because there all the emphasis is on performance and performance metrics and that kind of stuff. And it doesn't give any credence at all to the innovation of the thinker that's saying, hey, you know, I got a way of thinking about the world that isn't, it's not a curriculum. It's, it's the way I came to conceive of biology mm -hmm. you know like that as I told you yesterday the, the physical biology of the cell is a conception it's a vision and you know I was discouraged you know uh, I'm not going to mention names but Kunin put me in touch with people that he wanted me to talk to and I was just told straight up this subject's not ready for prime time it's not ready for you to write a book called physical biology of the cell well tough luck we did it anyway so anyway that's the, I, maybe those are the things I would say about teaching it's just a uh, it's a huge privilege. It's a, an amazing way to learn. It's an amazing way to innovate. It's an amazing way to create. And I think that we lack respect in the academy for synthesis. And I think that that demonstrates to me a lack of understanding of the history of science. You know, like you probably know very well about the three articles in Reviews of Modern Physics by Hans Bethe 
on nuclear yeah. physics, you know, like that, and that led him in a way to his nuclear, his Nobel Prize winning discoveries about how the sun works and stuff. But also it was, it was used by everybody. Mm -hmm. um, he did the same thing in Handbuch der Physik with uh, Sommerfeld in a way that created modern uh, solid state physics. There's a very interesting story, and I think I saw Frank Wilczek make a reference to this. Um, Enrico Fermi gave a summer school set of courses at the University of Michigan in 1930 or so, 1931. He wrote this article in Reviews of Modern Physics called The Quantum Theory of Radiation, and, and everybody studied it. And then he himself, by virtue of that, saw how to make the first quantum field theory in a way of, I think, of weak interactions. I may be off a little bit on my history, but you know, it's, so I think the act of synthesis is so incredibly important to our enterprise. Like what is our current statement about the subject of biology or our current statement about the earth system, you know, and it changes. And I think it's amazing and great when profound thinkers permit themselves the self-discipline and the opportunity to say, this is my witness statement, you know, like uh, Attenborough, David Attenborough just wrote um, a book, I think it's called A Life on Our Planet. It's his recent, most recent book. It starts out in Chernobyl. He also made a series, uh, a documentary, and he refers to it as his witness statement. And I just am a believer in that. Mm -hmm. I wish so many more people would do their witness statement mm. and permit themselves to let us see them. You know, as opposed to just see their papers. What is your witness statement? What have you concluded about our science, about the human condition, about our, our relationship with the truth? You know, you pick, take your pick. All those are relevant. And, you know, people like Philip Anderson, he was a superstar at this. You know, he wrote this book, Basic Notions of Condensed Matter Physics, and no one else could have written it. Period. And that's what I guess I'm after. Dejean is another one, you know. He wrote these books. No one else could have written them. They're uniquely Pierre Gilles de Gennes witness statements on polymer physics and on liquid crystals and you know, capillarity and whatever. So that's what I think the privilege of teaching gives us. The students today, overwhelmingly, they want to study computer science. Indeed. What's, what's the challenge for, for teaching students with that interest? And what are the assets in terms of their skills and their yeah. their their motivations hmm. i don't I, i'm not sure i even know because it's so hard to talk to them you know in other words it's i i would love to get more undergrads to come sit in my office and eat lunch with me and just tell me like honestly what are you thinking and what are, what are you up to and you know how many of you are doing this because somebody has brainwashed you that everything's about getting a job yeah or about the six figures or whatever um, how much of it's about fads? How much of it is about peer pressure? I don't know the answer to any of those things. The only thing I can say is that the other day in section, uh, one of my grad students had all the students tell the TAs something about themselves. And one of the students said, I, ha I hate bio. And I just thought, you know, I wasn't there, but I just thought, wow, that's such a remarkable thing to say as an 18 year old at a science institution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like really like did you ever see a whale breach <laughs> or you know like do you know that you can release an alligator and it will find its way back more than 100 miles to where from where it started or you know like I don't know what's the hate about that like I could easily say I hate the way biology is taught sure I hate coloring mitochondria orange yeah on some worksheet that's fine. That's a representation of immaturity more than anything, probably. Maybe, maybe. And I have a hard time with that because I guess, you know, I think I've always had a hard time with that. I think my reason is because of my own experience at age 18, but also the reality of their lives at age 18. They can yeah. go get, get sent to a war and get killed. They can for sure have a kid. Uh, they can go to prison. Like, they, they can do all the stuff. Yeah. So you're right. Like when I go to the beaches of Normandy and I go to the, the cemetery, I have to say, in a way, the one that hurts me the most, actually, and this is going to sound odd, is the German one. There's so many 16 and 17-year-olds yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You're just like, those are just, those are pitiful, teeny, tiny kids. Yeah. They're just, I don't know, they're just meat in a meat grinder is what they are, I think. So, 
so my my thought is, I try not to worry. I try to get people to suspend their disbelief and to just simply be there with me with an open mind and just try to listen to the interesting notion of the Craighead brothers mm -hmm. who were the first people who really tried hard to track animals and they put collars on grizzly bears in Yellowstone. It's pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing thing, you know? <laughs> like, like, could you just let go of all the other, other shit for a second yeah. and just think about a grizzly bear? <laughs> and do they know each other? And where do they go? And what's it like to be, like, I, I should show you a picture of these guys. Like, they put, tr they, they catch them in a cylindrical tube on the back of a truck. They tranquilize them and they pull them out, but they're, they're, their eyes are open. And they're putting a collar on this grizzly bear that's kind of got its head lifted up. <laughs> and they know it's a ticking time bomb. They got to get out of the way. And, you know, then they track this thing and they find out they know each other. The bears, you know, and they hang out and they go places and there's corridors and Yellowstone and, you know, there's just a lot of stuff. So I just keep on trying every day. Like today I'm going to go into buy one and I'm going to talk about the fossil record in Wales and how over the last 65 million years, we mammals that were that big went into the ocean, you know, like and became 10 meters long. And what's up with that? Yeah. Like, do they, you know, do they have genes for enamel? Toothless whales, like baleen whales, the humpback. Do they, have, do they have the genes for enamel? Yes, they do. Is it working? Nope. What's up with their odorant receptors? Do they sniff stuff? They've got odorant receptors, but they, you know, they're mainly not working. And, you know, like, there's a lot to think about yeah. if you stop for a second. Yeah. What's the nature of the fossil record, and why are there so many whales in the Himalayas. What's up with that? Again, I don't, I just don't know how to relate to not finding that interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's my problem in a way, back to the CS students. Yeah. I just don't know how to be not interested. Yeah. So I can't really relate to sitting in a classroom and just being pissed off or whatever. Well, maybe you'd, the thing to do is you just convey that enthusiasm, that love of curiosity. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's right. And, you know, at the, on the other hand, I'm totally 100% contradicting myself, obviously, because I completely relate. That's exactly why I didn't go to college. Yeah, yeah. Like, I 100% relate. I have no desire whatsoever to sit in freshman physics. Zero. Like, even for 10 minutes. So there you go. Yeah. So, you know, contradiction of my life. People are complicated. You're yeah. complicated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're a voracious reader. True. 75, 80 books a year. Prolific writer. I don't know about that. Look at how much you've written. It's a lot. Okay. It's I a know. lot. For a scientist, it's yeah. a lot. Okay. It's a lot. I'll take your word for it. How is that a two-way street for you? How does yeah. that work in the most beneficial way? Well, let, I mean, let's just say, for starters, that... You know, reading is one of life's greatest pleasures for me. It's something that, you know, I can remember back. I think I told you this already. I remember every week going to the library in St. Louis. I can picture going in there with my mom and, you know, my copy of Serengeti Shall Not Die, which I really think you need to get. Maybe I'll even get you a copy. It's got one of those old sort of library funny bindings, very thick with mm -hmm. the sort of cr cross-hatched patterns. And I just remember, you know, taking six or seven books home a week and just reading. I remember, you know, being a surfer guy, a serious, super serious surfer guy, but then I remember going home and sitting on my couch and reading Alive. You remember that book? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's the one about the soccer team, I guess, yeah. that crashes in the Andes. And, you know, it's being transfixed. And there's so many times that I've had that experience, you know. And then, as, as we talked about, I went to this guy Bill Martin's house and learned about Clifton Fadiman's Lifetime Reading Plan. And that led me to very odd things like I never in a million years would have thought that I would read Herodotus the histories but I loved that you know it's like gossip then I read Thucydides and that one was more dry but also interesting and learned about Pericles and you know I I guess I just always found what Fadiman refers to as the great conversation to be so incredibly compelling and such a privilege again you know to have access to the thinking of great minds like Jane Austen, you know, like how does that work? 
Um, so reading has just been paramount. Um, you know, I'm poorly educated, but I guess I'm largely an autodidact or something. And so reading has been my route primarily. And, you know, I like the slow pace uh, and I like the trust the process aspect. And I, and I like the confidence, you know, at the beginning, I didn't necessarily have the confidence, but I have it now knowing that in general, if I give my time and energy, I will figure it out. You know, so, and then, as I mentioned before, I love the Phil Andersons and the DeGens of the world. In general, I'm not a big fan of like the generic textbook, but when somebody tells me this is my witness statement, oh my God, you know, like I just, I lap it up. Because I want to see how do people engage with their lives? How do they live their lives? And they're different than me. And it's fun and interesting to see. And often I learn things about how I might do it, you know? So I, I, I'm very taken um, by the, um, let's see, I might even have the, the book here, which is called Darwin's Armada. But it's so interesting to see the continuity. It runs from Humboldt to Darwin. And actually, Darwin tried to go to some of the same places that Humboldt went. And then after that, Wallace, Hooker, and Huxley, all they, they would all stop because they'd read Humboldt and Darwin, like The Voyage of the Beagle. They'd try and go actually like even to the same rock on an island. And, and, um, and so, yeah, I just... I think it's such a privilege to be privy to the independent thoughts of independent thinkers. You know, that's what I love. Sean Carroll, not our Sean Carroll, but the biologist Sean Carroll. You know, his, uh, probably ours is, or our former guy is also an amazing writer, but, but I, I guess I've been more taken by the Sean Carroll at HHMI, the one who also has the Serengeti Rules documentary. Um, they're just such a, an act of originality. Mm -hmm. I love that. I just love that. I think I'm repeating myself, but it's it's just it's just an amazing thing. And then you know, fiction. Um, I love discovering new authors, and and I'm surprised even to this day. You know, I asked somebody, like I learned about Borges and Robertson Davies from Roald Hoffman, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and I got to talk to him a lot when I was at Cornell. And you know, I had no clue that there was a guy called Robertson Davies, and I didn't know about Borges. They've meant a ton to me mm -hmm. in the time since. So you know, recently. In terms of fiction, you know, I've become a huge fan of Taylor Jenkins Reid, you know, like she, and you may have heard of her through, um, there's a new, I think it's either on Amazon or Netflix, uh, called Daisy Jones and the Six, mm -hmm. and she's just an amazing writer. You know, she wrote Malibu Rising, and, and I like watching interviews with her. She's young, she's super dynamic, and then there's this woman, Maggie Shipstead, who wrote Great Circle, which I think everybody should read. It's this, and there's a great video of her. It's five minutes long. It's basically about female pilots. And, um, and it's, it's a love letter to flying and the world. It's really cool. In fact, maybe when we finish, I can show you the video just so you can get a sense okay. of it. So, um, so anyway, yeah, I love the world of fiction. I just, whether it's classics like Moby Dick, Ulysses, whatever, or contemporary romance, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty indiscriminate. For your own science writing, yeah. when is it a book and when is it an article? Yeah, um, you know, I think that articles are generally what goes on with grad students, you know, when we've, we've done a quantum of uh, insight or something, a quantum of experiment, a quantum of theory or something like that. Uh, as I was saying earlier, the book thing is just about synthesis, you know, like it bugs me to have had a 30 year career and, and to see all the papers, just the endless stream of papers and to wonder like, what did we accomplish? You know, for you that worked at the American Institute of Physics, I would love to hear your views on this. You know, where is Heisenberg now? And what I mean by that is I had the privilege a few years ago, I guess it was 2017 or 18, of going to a Solvay Congress, hmm. you know? It was the first one on the physics-biology interface. There were a lot of Nobel Prize winner types there or whatever, and we had our picture taken. You know the famous pictures of Solvay. Sure. And I was saying to another person who actually was an undergrad here once upon a time, was a famous professor somewhere else, I'm not gonna say who, but I was just like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sharp people here, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm in the presence of any Heisenbergs or whatever. And I, then I thought a little bit about this Dirac comment, or at least supposedly a Dirac comment about in the 1920s, a third rate scientist could do first rate science, and in the 50s, a first-rate scientists would have a hard time doing third-rate science or something along those lines. And, and as I looked at all the people I was at the Solvay with, 
You know, some of them are super smart, yeah, super sharp and creative. And it just made me wonder, you know, like what does it mean to be an impactful human being in this era? You know, like, is it that the quantum era is mythology? And it's always been like this, that there's a bunch of foot soldiers. Or is it that, you know, we live in a world where it's hard to make a big insight, you know, like if we, I, I, you know, I don't know the answers to any of these things. I just find it Meaning interesting. that there's maybe a lot more noise in the world now than there was in the 20s and 30s? There, well, there's, there's both noise, but also there's a lack of, we made this compelling advance that's going to touch everything. You know, like my friends and I, when we reflect on the last 60 or so years of physics, I think a lot of times we come to the idea that renormalization group, Ken Wilson and all those people, like that was the last big, big thing. But I don't know if that's true. You know, maybe you need the distance to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, you know, between 20, 2000 and 2020 was an amazing time and, and that's the era in which quantum computing came online and, and that's gonna transform our, the whole of society forever. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know at all. But I like to write books because of this point. So coming back to your question, which is what have we accomplished? What have we learned? What does it mean? How do we bring it under one umbrella? Can we curriculumize it? You know, would I wanna, going back to the thing about Einstein at ETH, what am I failing to tell all these brilliant 18 year olds that I'm gonna meet at one this afternoon? Yeah. What am I failing to tell them? And the only way I can know that is to try to have a bit of a broad view of what we've accomplished in our science. And, you know, I'm terrible at it, but I've tried to figure out what, you know, like what's going on across the waterfront in you, science. You mentioned Enrico Fermi. I love yeah. this idea of people that knew him. Yeah. This, this idea that if you could ask Fermi, are you an experimentalist or a theorist? Yeah. He would have looked at you funny because yeah. that, those distinctions were meaningless to yeah. him. Yeah. So one of the themes of our talks has been you know, for you, this need for fluidity between right. experiment and right, theory. Sure. Do you see that as an ideal that, you know, in the long run, looking to the future, that's where scientists need to head? Hmm. No, probably not, because I, the reason I say that is I just, I think I'm a believer in, truly a believer in diversity. And I, I think, did we talk about the Kinsey Report at all during all, all of our conversations? So... That meant a lot to me, and, and what I mean by that is, like, maybe it's statistically flawed. Like, I don't want to get into whether or not the Kinsey Report was statistically flawed, but what I want to say is that I believe that the breadth of human experience is quite wide, and I'm going to use sec human sexuality as the, as the basis of that for the moment. You know, it's like people have different tastes. They have different natural instincts. or what I don't, I don't want to say the wrong words and piss somebody off, but at the end of the day, I accept that people have different ways of navigating their lives sexually or whatever. And that's, to my mind, totally cool. And I don't want to say that there is one way for science to proceed. I just think that's silly. In fact, going back to Fermi, I heard, again, it may be apocryphal, he was asked what do Nobel Prize winners have in common, and he said nothing, not even intelligence. And I don't think he meant it as an insult. I think he meant just like, you know, it's all out there. You know, it's just different people have different passions, different strengths, different obsessions, different uh, talents, technical talents or whatever. And so for me personally, I, you know, I'm not an experimentalist, but I have incredibly solid, super strong experimental group members. So obviously I write a lot of papers that are experimental papers, but that fluidity is absolutely central to me, for me in this life. Um, I think it's necessary in biology in part at the moment because of a lack of respect for theory. But I, I crave for the day when people like Daniel Fisher, who's a theorist at Stanford, you know, will be taken even more seriously by the biology community. You know, I think they're wrong, not him. I think they're dead wrong. Like I've been with him in meetings where, you know, he, I, maybe I shouldn't be calling out an individual, but I have so much respect for him where I can tell that the biologists are, in a way, thinking that they're his superior. And I'm 100% thinking, you got the sign wrong on that one. This guy's really important to your, your, he's more important to you than you are to him, in other words. So I, I think the specialization in physics is awesome. And I think it's necessary, you know, like the people that 
with rare exceptions, the people that build LIGO uh, are just, you know, have, require a sophistication. Do you know this guy, James Gunn? Sure. So he's another one, like Fermi, that really, really impresses the heck out of me in this regard. You know, like when they did the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, as best I understand it, you know, this is based on not being a participant, reading some popular book about it. But, you know, he's a guy that practices as a theorist. He practices as an observational astronomer, but also, like, he practices as, like, how do you design the cameras? Yeah. And I just find that to be amazing. Yeah. You know, and I think that, like, when I think about Fermi in the 30s, it's stunning. I just told you. He wrote the defining article, in a way, on quantum electrodynamics. Fermi Dirac statistics. What is, what is his gang doing in Rome? They're basically shooting neutrons at every single element they can. Systematic, rigorous. And I'm going to lead this uh, associates trip in October, and we're going to the Enrico Fermi Museum for just that reason. So, I, I mean, and then... There's some really interesting articles, like I think this guy, Jay O'Rear, who was at Cornell, uh, talked about Fermi, the data analyst, and how he was already doing Bayesian things in the 50s. That that was, that was his way of conceptualizing it, you know, like right in the spirit of Laplace. So, I mean, that, he's rare, right? Fermi's about as rare as they get. Yeah. Well, Rob, I want to ask one last question Sounds to wrap good. up this amazing series of conversations. Yeah. It'll have a, a, a retrospective element and then obviously one looking to the future. So yeah. sort of in terms of your identity, you're really still an electrician, right? Yeah. The way you see the world, the way yeah. you see yourself. And a surfer. And a surfer. And a yeah. surfer. Looking to the future in all of the dramatic ways that you've pivoted, mm -hmm. taken on new things, followed your nose, just don't doing the things that are interesting and real to you, yeah. being a surfer, being an electrician, how might that serve as a guidepost for the science you want to do for as, however long you want to be active? Yeah. I, I, I have to say, you know, that I just don't know the answer to that. And, you know, maybe, maybe one of the points of this whole adventure is a belief in the non-belief of the plan. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've had lots of plans, and, I've, and they're good guideposts, as, to use your word, for action, but it just seems like almost never do things turn out the way the plan sort of specified them. So, you know, as you probably have been able to guess, I think I'm in a bit of a low point, actually, in my life, and I'm going to just say that frankly, and, um, and I don't know what the future holds for me. You know, like, I'm, I'm in a bit of a pessimistic mood. I don't know whether, you know, I, I, I remember um, our colleague who I think you interviewed, maybe Don Cohen or somebody interviewed him, and... He used to come to my office, I tried to get him to be my math coach, and he was, um, you know, maybe this is overly personal, you can decide to edit it out, but he was telling me that he, when he decided to retire, he, even though others didn't necessarily notice a loss of powers, he said he noticed a loss of powers on his own. And so, you know, I'm thinking hard about what the what nexts might be. I don't want to teach the same course and do the same things over and over again, and so, I think that's a big question. Um, you know, being honest, as I get older, the question of meaning has always been critical for me. That's why I went off on my adventure on my own to study physics, you know, yeah. and I think I maybe told you about driving my dad's car at the speed limit. I think I told you about that. Like, I was, I was in the quest for order and meaning, and I feel that science has brought me, brought me a lot of meaning, but, you know, as as our mortality gets closer to the horizon, I find that I don't know how to deal with that. You know, like I don't feel that I've got that part of meaning figured out. And I kind of hate the idea of coming here and just going through the motions, you know? So I don't know. It's like the most honest answer I can give you. But I don't think psychologically I will ever be able to escape being the surfer electrician guy. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I'm 62 years old. Like how am I going to, at this age, am I going to get over that? And I think I told you, there's, there's faculty members here that have criticized me for that insecurity or whatever you want to call it. And, but I reject that. Like, that just means they don't understand, in my opinion. So you'll stick around as long as the science is compelling. That's you'll right. never stop learning. You'll never That's stop right. reading. That's you'll right. never stop writing. That's right. But all of the motions yes. of a professorial life, yeah. that's going to end as soon as it's not interesting to you anymore. I, I would think that would be true. I'd want to be a bit careful about it, you know? Like, I want to make sure that it's not a bad mood, 
Right. You know, so I'd let it, I'd let it maybe ride for a couple of years, but you know, I do think that it's something where um, life is too precious to, to uh, yeah, to let yourself just do something because that's what you've always done. You know, when I was a kid, I read many times Thoreau's Life Without Principle. Did we talk about that at all? Yeah. Yeah, and so you know that meant a lot to me. Like, what are your motivations? Maybe it's overly idealistic on my part. You know, maybe one needs to be some element of practical. And I don't know the answer to that part either. You know, like there's all these meaning questions that are front and center. You know, it's funny. Maybe we, we could end on this. It's, uh, you know, a surfer, you don't have to have faith in the next wave. Right. It's coming. It is. Right? Yeah. But as a scientist, it sounds like what you're saying is you need faith in the next big thing yeah. to keep you engaged, to keep you energized. And maybe you're not so sure. You're not as sure as the next wave. I don't know. I mean, because I... Aside from bad mood, curiosity about the world, a sense of wonder, I don't think that's ever gone away at all. No, yeah. but I'm saying in the prof professor's context of yeah. papers and grants and a lab and students and yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, as far as that goes, yeah, I'll have to think about it a little bit more. Not that, you know, not that it'll be part of this, this conversation, but I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I guess I view my job as a professor as trying to help people realize their dreams. And as long as there are students that come thinking that my lab is a place where they can realize those dreams, you know, that's, that's a good reason to continue. Um, there's the very hard question of does the National Institutes of Health decide to continue the privilege, me having the privilege of getting funded? And, yeah. you know, that's a tricky one sure. for reasons that we discussed over the course of And there's of the our... ageism thing with grants and all of that. That's too. right. So, you know, where all that will play out, I don't, I don't know, you know, and... Um, I could imagine maybe doing things that are more theorist oriented again rather than having the lab. But yeah, I don't know. Y you know, again, I think these are things that you and I could talk about privately that where there's a lot of enlightenment to, to be had, you know, like what's the meaning of a life and how does one accept and move through change? And when is when does one need to actually accept change? And, you know, all those things. I, I don't have answers to any of those things. Well, I'll tell you what. Yeah. When you figure it out. We'll reconnect for another Thanks. session. All right. Rob, good. this has been awesome. Thank yeah. you.